<laughs> oh, doesn't that get you going? But let's stand up. Let's get ready to worship the King of Kings, God of all glory, the one who puts breath in your lungs, the one who has taken away all our sins. That's enough to get you worshiping God forever and ever and ever and ever. Father, we come in the name of your son, Jesus, to give you glory, to, to receive instructions, to walk in your ways, to strengthen us in our inner man. We ask that you would grant to us discernment and wisdom today. And all these things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. From the rising of the sun to the ending of the day, one name alone be praised. Every nation, tribe, and tongue, all creation lifting up. Your name alone we raise. good and you are just one day the lonely pray from the heights and from the depths in every heart with every breath your name alone we raise Matthew 3 verse 11 states, I baptize with you water for repentance, but after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And written in Acts 10, 44 and 45, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished by the gift of the Holy Spirit who had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Come Holy Spirit, 
fill us all today. Yes, Lord. Bring us your power. Yes, yes. We invite you, Holy Rest Spirit. On us. We invite you to move on us. Amen. We invite you to speak to us. We invite you to make yourself known however you want to do so today. We invite you to work on our hearts, work on our minds, work on our bodies. Fill this place. Fill this place. As the Spirit was moved over the water,
They bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and say, You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all.
in day let incense rise day and night night and day let incense rise day and night night and day let incense rise day and night night and day let incense rise day and night night and day You're the Omega. You're the beginning. You're the end. Everything is wrapped up in you, Lord. And I worship you, Father God, that you've sent your Son here and your Spirit so that we might be drawn to those things that are eternal, that we could be drawn to the things that are valued in your eyes, things that you esteem. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Worship you, Lord, because you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory, Lord. I ask you to open our eyes and and that we would recognize what you did in our lives, Lord. Because if we really get a picture of what you did, we'd be worshiping you. We'd be standing. We'd be lifting our hands up. We'd give you glory in every area of our lives. We'd be singing to you as we wake up. We'll be singing to you as we go to sleep. We'll be talking about you throughout the day. Because you deserve it all. You deserve it all. Oh, my Jesus, I worship you. Thank you. We are grateful for you, Lord. We're grateful for you, Lord. And we ask that you continue the work in our lives. Because your word says that you'll perfect that work until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Father, that we're going to cooperate with you so that we don't fall behind. Because your word says that we don't come behind any good gift. Let us all utilize the gifts that you've given to us, Lord, to advance your kingdom, to bring you glory, to shine light in darkness. Teach us, Holy Spirit, how to be salt, the salt of the earth. Hallelujah. We love you, Father. We love you, Father. Spirit of God, I'm asking you to move upon each one of our hearts. I ask you to remove what holds us back, what hinders us. We ask that you correct us. We ask that you give us discernment that we might know. I pray, Father God, that we would be able to be sensitive to your spirit so that we can be led by your spirit. Because you'll lead us and guide us into all truth. 
And that's what we want. That's what we desire. We want all of you, Lord. And in order to do that, we give you all of ourselves. We stand before you in awe. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Can and I share amen. something really quickly, Pastor Steve? Excuse me. Can I share something? Really Please. Quickly? Yes. You keep playing if you want. I just sense that God wanted, wants every single person here to know that he wants to speak to you and do something in your life today. But it's not enough just to come to church and know that there's something in our heart that needs to prepare and believe that we're going to receive what he wants us to hear. And so I just felt like he wanted us just to take us just a moment. And if you believe that God is here and he wants to do something in you and you want to hear from him, you want him to touch you just for a moment, maybe just something, lift up your hands or close your eyes and just do something to tell him in faith, not asking, just saying, yes, I receive it. I want to receive it. I receive what you're going to do in me today, in me personally. And I thank you ahead of time. And I know that you will. I thank you ahead of time for what you are going to speak personally to my heart or whatever it is that you want to do, Holy Spirit, whether it's healing or anything, we're open we're open and we are thanking you ahead of time for real like this is about to happen if we believe this isn't just a gesture we are right now receiving by faith the substance of what he wants to give us so look for it look for it don't forget in Jesus name receive that word and I'm going to make that a personal word for myself and that's what Mary's trying to present you have to expect God glory to God are we all in yeah, yeah. hallelujah well greet one another and you may be seated Welcome to Community Life Church. What a beautiful day. It is so good to see all of your smiling faces. I'm glad you're here with us. I just want to welcome you. My name is Jason. Um, this morning, I want to let you all know that we are here on mission at Community Life Church, and that mission is to know God, find purpose, and experience life. And we're going to continue that mission until all come to know the, the glory of God. Amen. Uh, if you're watching us uh, online, we're going to thank you for joining us online. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, push all those buttons so that more and more people get the message. Yeah. I guess it's supposed to affect the algorithm or something, but I'm not even sure what an algorithm is. So <laughs> anyway, um, if, you're, if you're here in person, just so you know, we do, we do have this on YouTube and on Facebook, so you can watch it again. If, you, if there's something you hear that you want to hear it again, you can watch it again. And, and those that are watching online, we just want to invite you to come here in person. Be here next Sunday. We'd love to have you. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We're so glad to have you. 
We would like to connect with you a little bit. So if you'd look in the seat back in front of you, there's a, a little card. And it looks like the picture on the screen up here. If you'd grab that card, fill out those few lines, and drop it in the box on your way out today. Uh, that way we can just stay connected with you, let you know what's going on. I promise you we will not spam you with a bunch of email or anything. We'll just let you know a few things that's going on here at the church in case you want to get connected a little deeper and know a little bit more what's going on. Um, also, we have an app on our website, clcbutler.org. You can uh, download that app. It's a little icon there with the purple and white cross thing. Um, but that's just another source so you can know what's going on here at the church. So that you're, you're wondering, what time was that meeting supposed to be? I forget. Was it 6.30 or 7? I don't know. Well, go to the app and check. That way you know, right? Um, so download that. Make sure you, you know what's going on here. Uh, this is the part of the service where we receive tithes and offerings, and we try to make that as easy as possible. So we have several ways to give. We can do it electronically through the, uh, the website, clcbutler.org slash give. You can give through the app that I just mentioned to you if you've already downloaded that app. And you can also give by texting to give to the number there on the screen. Um, finally, if you have uh, you know, cash, we accept cash. If you have checks, we'll take that too. Um, but just look in the seat back in front of you. There's a, a, an envelope. You put that in there and then drop that envelope in the box on the way out today. Uh, we'd appreciate that because your gifts are what allow this ministry to continue. It's your faithfulness and giving that allows things to happen. You realize that if, if the people in this room are not faithful in giving, this ceases to be. Right? We're no longer able to reach the, the city of Butler. We're no longer able to reach the area because it's your gifts and your faithfulness and giving that allows that to happen. So we just want to thank you for that, first of all. Say thank you so much for, for giving. But also I just want to say, just to, uh, speak a couple of words to that right now, and that is that that, you know, the Word of God tells us that he, that, that he appreciates and he, he, he loves obedience rather than sacrifice. So it's not about an amount that you give. It's not just that you're giving. You know, th there's been a lot of people who have, uh, who have used the idea of giving for their own benefit. That have taught that, hey, you've got to give till it hurts and sacrifice and, and give so much. And sometimes that may be true. God may be telling you to do that personally. And if God's telling you that, by all means, obey. But it's more important that you obey than about the amount that you give. I mean, certainly the Bible does give us some, some guidelines. It talks, you know, we talked many times about how the, the Bible gives the tithe as, as a guideline. It's kind of a jumping off point or a starting point, and then it goes even beyond that. But it's not just about an amount. It's about the heart of giving. And it's about being obedient to God and his word. And as you do that, he can bless you. And so as we, as we give today, I just, wanna, uh, just wanted to give that word and, and, and say a blessing over that, and then we'll tell you about some opportunities we have upcoming. So God, thank you that you bless us beyond measure that you've given to us more than we could ever possibly give back. Yes. You've given us your son, Jesus Christ, and we're so grateful for that. And we thank you, Lord. But, Lord, we do give back a, a portion of what you've given us today. We give it back recognizing that it all belongs to you anyway and that we're merely stewards of it. And we surrender to you, Lord, and pray that you would use this for your glory, that more and more people will come to the knowledge of you, Lord God. We want to see souls saved. Yeah. We want to see people set free. Yeah. We want to see people living the lives that you have called them to live. And we give you all honor, give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want to tell you about some great opportunities you have coming up this week and every week. We have Tuesday morning prayer and Wednesday evening prayer. Yes. And you need to come be part of it because God moves in our, in our midst whenever that happens. Whenever we come together as a body, things happen. You realize that there is more power in prayer. Now, your prayer as an individual is powerful. But when you come together as a group, there's just a, a, a synergy that happens where more and more things can, can, can happen both in your life and the lives of those around you and in this city. So we just want to encourage you guys, come be part of it Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. or Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, if you can make either one of those or both of those, come be part of that and, and you will be blessed. Last Wednesday was awesome. We had a, a worship time with, the, with the, the band played for us and, and sang during that. It, it was good. And God spoke uh, through tongue interpretation and different things as well. So that was really neat. Uh, I want to mention to you uh, Jack Summer Camp, Jesus Adventure Camp. Uh, this is for youth, and it's from June 26th to 30th. Um, we've got a few things to tell you about. First of all, you, you've seen the videos. If you've been here for the last two or three weeks, you've seen the video we've shown, right? It looks pretty exciting. God's going to be doing some things in the, in the hearts of these youth, and, and we're believing even now. And I just want to ask you to pray with us that, that all the youth that go will have an encounter with God because that's what it's really all about, right? I mean, it's not just about having a good time. Yes, having a good time is part of it, but they need to have an encounter with God, and that's what we're hoping and believing for. So first of all, I just ask you to pray for that. Pray that our youth, not just from this church, but all of them that are gathering, will have an, an encounter with God. Amen? Yes. Um, but beyond that, they're also doing a fundraiser to help raise some funds to pay, to pay for part of this. So we just want to encourage you guys, uh, till Mother's Day, which is next week, right? right. It's coming up pretty quick. 
So uh, <clears throat> the hint might be a good idea if you haven't thought of anything yet. The youth are going to be doing a fundraiser. They're selling flower bulbs, uh, flowers and bulbs to, uh, to raise money for the Jesus Adventure Camp. You can go to our app. Remember that app I mentioned a minute ago with the purple and white cross thing? Yeah, go to that app, and you can uh, get information there. Um, you can either designate a uh, particular youth to support, or you can simply put it towards the group altogether, and those, those funds will be dispersed. Um, that's just a way to raise funds and help, help pay for some of that expense. Uh, don't forget to sign up through the app, and if you're interested in sponsoring a youth, uh, please use the drop-down youth in the giving app. Parents of youth, you must sign up with a $50 deposit today for the camp. So please see Pastor Ben or Amanda with any questions you might have. Um, but once again, parents of youth, in case you didn't hear it, today you need to sign up today, 50 bucks, to make sure that, that you have that um, ready to go. I don't want anybody to miss out because they forgot. And a matter of fact, if you need to pull out your phone right now and sign up, I'm cool with that. I won't be offended. That way you don't forget because if anybody has like me, you know, an hour from now you Anyway, uh, ladies, we are continuing uh, the monthly fellowship and Bible study this Tuesday from 6.30 to 8 here at the church. Uh, I know you guys finished this, the book study you were going through and had a great time with that, um, but it's still going to come together um, to study God's word together. It is important to carve out time for the things that, are, that, that bring about spiritual encouragement and growth in our lives. So ladies, I want to encourage you to be here Tuesday night for that. Um, once again, that's at 6.30. Uh, 6.30 to 8, yeah. Uh, Mother's Day, child dedication. So here at this church, one of the things that, that's important to us is children and families. Because God tells us to, to care about children, amen? It's kind of important, right? Um, but as a church, we want to celebrate the life of your child alongside you and your family. So child dedication is a way that we take time to pray as a church over the children of, of the church. We're, the, the parents basically are making a commitment, that, hey, I want to raise my child in a way that honors God. And we as a church say, hey, we're going to come beside you and encourage that. Yeah. You know, if, if we see your kids out and about, we're going to encourage them. We're going to, you know, pat them on the back and, and, and tell them we love them. And, and we're going to do the things that we can do as a church family to help. Because we value lives. We value children. We want to see them grow in the knowledge of God. Amen? Amen. We, it, it, there's a lot to be said about, oh, this generation. I, let me tell you about this generation, how lazy they are. Let me tell you about this generation, they don't get it. Right? And we can complain all day long, and that does nothing. Look, I'm guilty of it. I do it myself. I complain about, you know. <laughs> but we believe that God has good things in store for our kids, and we want to we bless them. So we have child dedication service coming up on Mother's Day um, where we pray that, that, you're, that we, we come together with the, the family and the parents to say, hey, we're going to come beside you and believe that you're going to raise this kid in the word of God. You're going to raise this, God, this child by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you're going to help them to walk in God's ways. You're going to point them in the right way. We're not, we're not just going to wait and see if maybe they make the right choice for their life. Because if you wait and see, you're going to be disappointed with the results, right? If, it just, if you take the wait and see approach, you're going to be disappointed with the results, period. Um, so instead, we want to begin teaching them at a young age and just praying over them and stuff. So uh, see the app for more information and, and to sign up to be a part of that. Next week's child dedication as we celebrate children and mothers in our lives. It's kind of a celebration of both because you realize that it took the mother to have the kid. Anyway. Um, that's right. Well, you know, I, and I got an idea for you. You can buy some flowers and stuff yeah. through the app, through the youth. youth I guess I already talked about that. Finally, uh, rummage and bake sale. Get ready for our annual rummage sale and bake sale coming. Uh, it's July 20th through the 22nd from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, we're already collecting gently used items. So if you have stuff in your house that you're saying, you know, I really don't use that anymore. It's just collecting dust. Bring it and let us, let us pass it on to somebody else. It's a way we reach out to our community and bless the community as well as raising funds to support the church. Last year we were able to use the money to um, upgrade the fire system. And I'm not sure exactly what all it's designated for this year. But uh, the point is we, we want to reach our community really more than anything. This is an opportunity that our community actually comes in the doors. And, and it's like their, their guard's down because they're not coming in the doors, you know, thinking that, that they're going to be bombarded or anything like that. Because you realize that some people are uncomfortable walking into a church. If they've never walked into a church before, it's a little uncomfortable. But if they come in for a rummage sale, they come in with their guard down. And we have an opportunity to love them and to just share, the, share Christ with them even then. And, and we've had plenty of opportunity over the years as the rummage sale goes on to pray for people. Um, 
and, and we've even seen some people come come to the church after coming to the rummage sale first. So uh, we just want to encourage you to be part of that. Uh, and you can sign up to help both organizing and getting everything ready and then also serving on that day. I know it's several months away, but even now we need help organizing and stuff. So if you can do that, make sure you sign up to, to be part of that. And uh, without any further ado, Pastor Stephen Mamie, come share with us the word of God. Well, praise God. Uh, yeah, before we start, we had uh, a couple months ago, we had Elsie uh, Brewer go on a mission trip. And a lot of you uh, prayed for her, and a lot of you uh, helped her with funds. And so we're going to get a report from uh, Elsie Brewer. Give her a hand. Thank you, dear. I like this. This is weird. <laughs> yeah, so come on now. Make her feel happy and comfortable. Yeah. This isn't easy. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions, you know, simple about the event that she went on and how she, uh, you know, walked through uh, the mission itself. And so I'd like to ask you, where did you go on your missions trip? I went to the Dominican Republic. We went to a place called Hato Mayor. I think that's how you pronounce it, right? But, yeah. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, nobody would know how to pronounce it right, so you got away with that yeah, one. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> how long were you there? I was there for a week. It was over my school spring break. We went on a trip with my school. I and so your school, them, but... school organized the trip then? Yeah. Uh, it, was this the first mission trip that you were on? No, I went on one with my school. It was the same trip. They try to plan it every year, but because of COVID, it got shut down. Ah. But four years ago, four years ago, I went on the same trip to the same place. Wow. It was really cool. That's... But I, I was really sad that I couldn't go on it the past three years because COVID shut it down. But I was very excited that we were able to go on it this year. Excellent. Excellent. And so what are some of the things that you, you did there? What uh, were the things that you partook, uh, partook of ministry-wise? There was, it was split into five different groups, which was we did VBS, so we went with the kids. This is loud. Um, we went with the kids, and we would just gather them all up, tell them a story, and um, we had like a Bible story, and we had a translator so my one friend would read the story, and we'd act it out and do a little skit. We did Noah's Ark. And then we played games with them. We sang songs with them and just got to hang out with kids, and it was amazing. Like, it was crazy how, like, not knowing their language didn't really matter. Wow. Like, we couldn't communicate very easily without our translators, obviously. And there was a lot of times where they were saying things to me, and I was like, you know say. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't even know. But um, this is it's so far away and it's so loud. Um, but it was it was awesome to get to see how happy they were just to have us there. And then we also had a medical team, an optical team, a we had VBS, we had prayer and evangelism, and then construction some of the days. And I also did prayer and evangelism, which I wasn't very comfortable with to begin with because I'm not good, obviously, at public speaking at all. And just talking to people in general and praying in front of people, I'm very bad at that. But it was, I know that I want to go into missions, so I was like, oh, I got to do it. Like, I can't just <laughs> avoid it. So I went and I did it, and it was, it was actually, it was awesome just to get to, the translators made everything I say sound good anyway, so even if I did screw up, <laughs> nobody knew. So I sounded great, but um, it, was, it was great to be able to get out of my comfort zone and learn how to do that somewhat. And then I also got to sit in with medical a little bit because I was outside playing with the kids, and then it was really, really hot, and I got like sunscreen on my face, and it was running into my eyes, and they were burning, mm. so I was like, I can't be outside in the sun anymore. So I went inside and sat with medical, and I got to watch some of that, which was just really cool, getting to see these people that, like, don't usually have access to, like, medical, if they do even at all, get to see them, like, just get simple things and how much it can make a difference. Wow. Yeah, we're blessed in this country, amen? Yeah. 
Uh, you, you brought some pictures that, uh, yes. yeah, could you explain them as we go up? Yeah, so this one is just the, it's the sunrise out of the compound. So we lived like in a compound area with our group, the people from our school that went. And there was an upper balcony mm. and that's where we had chapel in the mornings. And so that was the, the sunrise over there. We all, a lot of us tried to get up at like 6 a.m. every morning, get ready real quick and run upstairs to like do devotions, read Bible, pray while the music team practiced and just watch the sunrise, which was beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, this one was... Yeah. This was medical. The guy in the orange shirt is, he was like leading our group. He's my basketball coach, but he's also like the, I think, vice president of the organization that we went with. So he was doing medical, and that's the lady there that they were doing it with. And there was a time when the translator had to step out. And that kid, he lives with the, some of the people who live near the compound, and they work with. MGM, which is the place we went with, but he's 10, and he ended up translating wow. when the translator had to step out, so he was translating for medical, and it was really cute, huh? He's 10, perfect, fluent Spanish, fluent English, Wow. and he was able to translate. Oh, really that, cool. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the background of that other picture, there's also optical. I don't know if you could see it, but that, yeah, in the back corner, they had all the yeah, you can just see white stuff on the tables. But um, they had all the different glasses things this that they would hold awesome up to people and But <laughs> that was one of the days we were just playing with kids outside. It started raining, but we were still playing under this big thing. And, yeah, it was just really fun. Is that, that was, the team? That's the team. That's everybody we went with. So most of them all go to my school. And it was also crazy how many, like, relationships I built with them through this experience and how much like I could see some people grow so much in their faith mm. through it. It was really cool. There was people that I never would have thought would have gone on the trip that I saw and I got to know them and they also just grew so much. And it was so cool to see like the organization we went with, it's called Leading God in Missions. So it is focused on the people and helping them, but it also helps. It's also about helping the people who go on the trip. Mm. And it's really cool to see just like it's not only helping them, because it's also helping you so much. That's really awesome. And then this one's my favorite one. So there was, it was the last village we went to on the last day. It was a shorter day. And at the very end, we were about to leave, about to pack up. And we were, like, leaving the last house. We were going to go back. And then these two guys came over, like, very last minute. And they came to medical. And they were just asking whatever they needed. It was just like Tylenol or something because it wasn't like that big of a deal. But we all kind of wanted to get out of there. We were tired. It was the last day. But then my coach was talking and he was like, all right, let's, let's just go. He was like, I kind of wanted to just give them the Tylenol and call it a day. But he still was like, no, we're going to talk to them. We're going to do that. And so he started talking to them and ended up asking if they wanted to receive salvation, and they did. Wow. And my friend, who is 10th grade, ended up, oh, that makes a noise. Um, she ended up getting to pray with them to receive salvation, and it was Sweet. so cool just to see these two guys get <laughs> saved and just to see my friend get to pray for them was really cool. Wow. That's excellent. So is there, I mean, you told us a lot yeah. of great highlights. Is there one thing that impacted you more than anything else? There's one thing that was pretty cool, a story basically that I have that was really cool. On the first day, the first guy that came into medical, I wasn't there. I was doing VBS that day. Or no, I was doing prayer and evangelism. I don't know. But, but, um, <laughs> but, just keep touching it and making noise. You're doing um, great. <laughs> but, there was the first guy that came into medical. They started talking to him, and he, they said that he was like three days away from having a fatal heart attack because oh, he was wow. in really bad condition, having really hard time breathing, just not, not doing so hot. And so they were able to, he was the first guy that came in, so they were able to talk to him, figure out what was wrong, and figure out like, hey, this dude needs to go to a hospital. Like, mm. He can't 
just state like this. Like, we can't give him anything. He needs to go to a hospital. But there's no way that that guy was going to be able to pay for it. Like, there's, they don't have money down there. It's crazy how poor they are and how much we have. It's ridiculous. But um, he had no way to get to a hospital and no money if he did. So they were, they were able to call an ambulance to come out, and it took like two hours for the ambulance to get out there, which was crazy that it even like was able to get out to that village. But it's a village, small village, out in the middle of a ton of cane fields, and they were able to get an ambulance out there and get the guy. But there was still no way that he would be able to pay for his bills. But um, there was somebody who, like right before the trip, had just donated some money to MGM and said, hey, just use this for whatever you figure out that you need it for. And they were able to give that guy the money to be able to pay to go to the hospital and get everything he needed. And awesome. like, we were doing prayer and evangelism that day and we saw the ambulance pull up and we were like, what's happening? So we went over just to see. And then we ended up getting to pray for that guy oh. too. And we just like saw everybody together just praying for him. And it was a really cool experience. That's really awesome. So what do you think? Do you think that missions is actually something that's important for the body of Christ? Of course. <laughs> yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, the Bible says go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Yes. That's... And that's, I mean, if we don't do it, who else is going to do it? Like, <laughs> Come on. That's we... good preaching right there. <laughs> But, so what do you have planned for the future in this <laughs> endeavor? I mean, right now I'm going to be working at a summer camp and then interning there and doing, like, it's local missions. That's what it is. Like, it, um, the main goal is to minister to inner city kids. And so a lot of them still, like, don't always get to hear that. And so it's cool to be able to, like, do local missions. But then also that I'm... Going, I'm going to be pursuing missions after that, but awesome. I'm not sure quite how yet. Well, let's give it up for her. That was a great job, Elsie. And it is true about standing in front of people that you start to get shaky. And thank you so much for sharing with us. Well, that was great. Glory to God. Go into all the world and... Make, here, everybody turn to Matthew 28. This is what it says. Go into all the world and make disciples. Praise God, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's us. It's like what she said. If, if we don't do it, who's going to? Who's going to? If you don't do it, who's going to? I mean, we got to own it like that. Make it personal. If I don't do, if I don't speak up to this person that God has put in front of me, who's going to? I mean, that person is going to spend eternity either in heaven or hell. And it doesn't mean that you all the time are going to lead them in their prayer of salvation. Just help them make one step closer to Jesus. Amen? Glory to God. <laughs> Yay. Sweet. Here we go. Oh, yes, I better go get it. Turn with us in your Bible to First John, the best book towards the back of the Bible. First John, we're going to do chapter 2 today, the second part of chapter 2. We're not actually going to finish chapter 2. Uh, Definitely. Just <laughs> yeah. as a little recap about this book of First John, uh, we subtitled it Walking in the Light of God's Word because he does talk a lot in this, these five chapters about walking in the light or walking in darkness. Um, but this book was written by the Apostle John. <laughs> This is the John who was one of the 12 apostles of Jesus, one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And, and John was one of the three closest to Jesus. I think if you've read the Gospels, you kind of remember that there's a threesome that 
Jesus chose to be mm -hmm. closest to him. You know, he, he, he was calling Peter, James, and John. He called the three of them up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He chose Peter, James, and John to go with him uh, when he raised up Jairus' daughter after she had died. He chose uh, Peter, James, and John to go with him deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with him yes. before he faced like the agony of the cross. And so some of the most important moments of Jesus' life uh, ministry were shared with John. And I mean, think about it, at the crucifixion as Jesus is dying on the cross, if you remember, he looks at John and he says, you know, to receive, here's Mary, like receive her as your mother to take care of her. And so Jesus had great trust in John mm -hmm. and, I, and John was also very close to Jesus. And think about all the things that he experienced. He was there when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. He was there in the boat. You know, seeing Jesus walk on water. Yeah. He saw Peter walk on water. He saw Jesus speak to the raging sea and calm the storms. He saw Jesus heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Uh, he, he saw and spoke with Jesus. He ate with him after Jesus came back, resurrected from the grave. Yes. For 40 days, he appeared and said to the disciples and many others. And so can you imagine the full life experiences that John had <laughs> talking with Jesus. And then he had a revelation. He was, he was banished to the Allopatmos, we know, for the preaching of the gospel. And while he was there, he had this spectacular revelation of Jesus Christ. That's mm -hmm. what the book of, book of Revelation is, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. And so John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, while on the Isle of Patmos, he writes that book of Revelation. Um, I, I think just can you imagine his life, the fullness of it, all those experiences that he had, and his understanding of truth, Yeah. having talked with Jesus and seen all these things. And I think no wonder he wrote at the last verse of the last chapter of the Gospel of John. He said, now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself couldn't contain the books that could be written, wow. that would be written. And I would imagine, like, no wonder John would say that. Like, how can I explain who this <laughs> Jesus, the Lord, God, is? And he would have written, I guess you can understand how he could have wanted to write volumes of books, but this book of First John, when he writes this book, he's an elderly man. This is about 60 years after the beginnings of the church, right. the day of Pentecost, when the church officially began. Um, it's now about 60 years later, so he's a wise apostle and a disciple. He's an experienced apostle. Yes. And, you know, I thought, as we were writing this, we thought, wouldn't it be awesome to have been John to be in your church and be like, John's going to come and do a Bible study. With us. Like, John's going to come. And <laughs> we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then as we were writing, it was like, well, wait, we kind of are being discipled by John because we're reading <laughs> the book that he wrote. But then I thought, no, he'd probably turn that quickly around and say, no, remember in my gospel of John that Jesus said it's the Holy Spirit Amen. who will come and lead you and guide you into all truth. So really, we're being taught today whether you realize it or not, but we should realize it, is the Holy Spirit's here to teach you. If you're born of God's Spirit, yes. he's the teacher and guide on the inside of you to, to teach you. And it really goes with what Mary was saying. He wants our expectation to rise. Like, I'm going to show you something mm. today. I'm going to disciple you today and show you something personally about who I am. And so I know that John would be quick to pass the glory on to God and say, so whatever you get, you're getting truly from the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's just pray before we do read this portion of First John chapter 2. Father, we ask you to teach us, guide us, disciple us this morning by the power and help of the Holy Spirit. Our ears are open, our hearts are receptive, and Lord, we make a determination not to just hear and expect, but whatever we hear, we want to be doers of it. Yes. We thank you, Father. Because it's in the doing, you say, that's where the blessing comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's read. We start in verse 12. This is 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. 
for his name's sake. Verse 13, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And I write to you children because you know the father. Verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all of that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And also its lusts. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So we're going to take a little deeper look into the uh, verses that we got up here in verse 12. We're going to take a look at that. And he starts off by saying, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Praise God our sins are forgiven. They're forgiven. And I said it earlier, just... If we get a revelation of that, we will be standing and worshiping God. And throughout the day, you're going to be thanking him. It's going to be a lifestyle because the, the, the more you understand who he is, the more you're going to worship him. I mean, really. I, it, and even the words that we sing, you might not like the music, but if you look at the words that is being spoken of, uh, if you're born again, you love those words. Day and you're, night, night you, and day. Yeah. <laughs> you love him. Rise. You love him. He's forgiven us our sins. Hallelujah. And I love how John is saying little children. And, and really he's, he's, not in, in, he's not writing just to little children as we would think, like baby dedication idea. He, he's writing to the entirety of Christendom here. He's calling a, an endearing term little children. And that's regardless of age. And he's talking about your sins are forgiven. You know, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, I love it. Beloved, now you're children of God. Not going to be when I die and get to heaven. You know, we come to a realization of who we are and who he made us to be. Our life will be different. It'll be completely changed. He says we are now children of God. This is going to be up on the screen. Let's go to verse 13. And in verse 13, John uses three different designations. And he writes to fathers, young men, and children. And I write to you fathers. That's, that, this is speaking of mature believers. These, these are men and women who have reached a spiritual maturity over a long period of time by being a doer of the word. And walking with the Lord and being able to be corrected and listen to the Spirit of God in His directions. And then he says, I'm writing to you young men. And I really like this. He speaks of those who are not quite as mature, but uh, they've been taught in the Word. And they have grown in character. And they're becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ. And he writes to them, and I love this. He says, because you're strong, because you know the Word of God. You know the word of God, and that word abides in you. And when, that, when you know the word of God and it abides in you, you're going to overcome the evil one all the time. And, and understand, they, they understand the difference between uh, right and wrong, uh, good and evil. Uh, they're able to handle the word of God accurately and the way they are speaking out, which is we know the sword of the spirit and this is how we, we fight against the uh, thoughts that come. They're taking every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. When, you know, Because sometimes thoughts just come to our mind, and they are squirrely at times. Amen? And it's the time to take that thought captive. And does this line up with the Word of God? This is, the, this is what he's talking about. These young men have knowledge of the Word enough that they can judge the thoughts that come into their mind. And then he's writing to little children. And, you know, in verse 13, it's a different word, Greek word, for children. This one is, means that these, it doesn't necessarily mean youngsters. It actually means somebody who just got born again. 
It's what it means. I'm, they're immature in the faith. Uh, they're beginning to walk with God. They know that now my sins have been forgiven. The sacrifice that Jesus washed my sins away. And I'm now a child of God. And this isn't like you're a child chronologically. This is, I just came into the kingdom and now I'm a child. Yeah. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that because we all start off there. That's right, yeah. And so John, again, let's remember that he's, you know, likely 85, maybe 90 years old whenever he's writing this letter to the church. And think about it, after all those years, he would have seen a couple of generations of believers grow True. up in the church. After 40, or this many years, 85 to 90 years old, he's helped disciple many people. Mm -hmm. he's, he's watched as people mature, not just chronologically and get right. older as the right. years go by, but he's watched people mature spiritually, and this is what he's talking about, fathers, young men, and children, that there's this generational growth, you know, that the point is that we are supposed to be growing. And so right. he's writing to these fathers saying, you know, you, these fathers who've reached a measure of spiritual maturity, obviously, because he says, because you know him who's from the beginning. And that maturity doesn't happen. You know, you could come to church and, you know, come to church for 50 years and your hair will slowly get grayer and, you know, your wrinkles will start to form and have all the things that happen whenever you get older chronologically. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be growing more mature spiritually. Right, right. Because these fathers, I believe that he's talking to who know him from the beginning, have grown and matured in their faith little by little through their relationship with right. Christ. They're, it's through love and obedience and letting the word of God change you on the inside. This is how we mature. Come on. It's not just simply chronological time of, of saying, well, I gave my life to Christ 50 years ago. <laughs> and so, you know, it's become, it's up becoming more like Jesus. Amen. And so John addresses the church family saying Right, this he's way. writing to the fathers and the spiritually mature, and this helps us to see the goal, as a matter of fact. Yeah. We see the the progression that uh, is cyclical, for sure, and it should be ongoing, is that we are always growing, we're, we're maturing. We're, we're not the same as we were a year ago. These little children are growing up to the young men. The young men, uh, they're being put into them the word of God by the fathers so that they can quickly bring the word of God up into their heart and their mind and they can judge the things of the world through the word of God. It's important for us because the fathers are the ones who are teaching not just the young men but also the children. They're teaching them how to be conformed to the image of Christ. They're helping them with their character. They're mentoring. That's the word that's used today. They're mentoring them. And in order for this, this to work, there has to be the fellowship and not just a, a, a fellowship. Hey, I, I remember you. I, yeah, I remember you. Hey, what was your name again? You know, it is like coming to a place where we actually have fellowship. We spend time to get to know one another. We understand each other. And part of that, and the only way that really makes it work, is that we have to have honor. Honor your elders. Remember what the Bible says there? Honor your elders in respecting them and be attentive to what they're saying. That's necessary if you're going to have any kind of biblical mentorship coming through the church. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. And there's such a need for spiritual fathers in the church today Amen? Yeah, and, uh, you know, the young men today really need to see a role model. Yeah. Because the world will give them a role model, you know that. And many of these young men are growing up in fatherless homes, absentee dads. You know, because uh, you <laughs> the woke culture will tell you what masculinity in men is. Toxic. Toxic masculinity. <laughs> have you heard the term? Okay. You know, and this is the problem because we have young men that don't want to work, uh, let alone work hard. <laughs> you know, they want to be on the, uh, the Internet. They want to play video games. They, you know, they want somebody else to take care of me. They are watching porn. They're smoking weed. They're living in their parents' basement at 30 years old. You know, that would have been an embarrassment in the 40s, the 50s, 
You know, even the 60s and 70s, it would have been an embarrassment. You know, but now, you know, you <laughs> we have to take the time. We have to understand the responsibility that we have and we have to sacrifice for others. And that is something that has to be taught to this younger generation. But it, it's still not there because honestly, you know, uh, those responsibility and sacrifice was noble then. It's noble today. Even though culture will tell you that that is bogus and in a sense, they're trying to tell you that it's white supremacy to be responsible and, and to have a, a, a lookout for someone else other than yourself. But why do you think it's so uncommon in today's society? Why, why do you think that these young people right now don't get it? Like, because culture is telling you that male masculinity is bad. But masculinity in females is good. See how they're trying to reverse the roles that God has ordained? We have, even in the military, they have drag queens in the military to encourage people to join. We have sports world telling us that it's okay for a man to compete against a woman as long as he says he's a woman. Do you know that this is a war on women? It's a war on women. Remember what uh, in the book of Revelation? The woman flies off and is running, and the devil opens his mouth and a big flood comes, but the earth opens up and protects the woman, and then she's taken off to the wilderness in protection, and then what does it say? It says, then the serpent went out and made war against her offspring. We've got to understand that this false belief, this, this, all this lie about gender confusion is, is, I can be both male and female. It's a lie. It's a plain lie. You know, uh, you know the L look, these are people that need help. We don't hate these people. We want to help these people. And there's plenty of those people that want to get out of that, but have no idea. Because their, their culture, the LGBTQ1A2S++++. That's actually for real. That's, that's a real designation. We chuckle, but yeah. this is kind of what, yeah, we should, we should question. Yeah. Because and it's. You come back and understand that this is, this is a, this is at war with God. And if you read Jonathan Kahn's book, The Return of the Gods, this, this is really coming from the goddess Ishtar. And when we were, because we've been reading the Old Testament, we see that it's also Ashtaroth. And then in the Greek mythology, it's Aphrodite. In the Hindu goddess, it's Kali. And in the New Testament in Ephesus, it's the goddess Diana. There's the same demon spirit. But God made them male and female. That's pretty simple. And it's important. Fathers, you're incredibly important. Yeah. You need to teach men, young men, how to be men. You have to teach them the the traits of being a man. And when they start getting it, guess what? Violence will go down. The use of pornography will drop off. Really, that you'll find the desire of work and accomplishing something is going to increase for sure. They're going to learn how to be a giver, not a taker. They're going to find that they actually are desiring to love their family, protect their family, put their family first place. They're, they'll have a vision for their life rather than being in mom's basement and playing video games. See, nobility will come back. And it won't come back in the whole world, folks. We're on a spiral that cannot be changed. But yet we have the ability to be fathers in the faith to help the young men and the children, and it is our responsibility.
Deuteronomy chapter 6 tells us our responsibility. It's important that we do it. We got to have a vision and impart a vision to our, our kids about challenging themselves, challenging themselves to do better, challenging themselves to be productive, challenging them. God is re, He has wired men to take on this responsibility. He, he's wired men to carry the weight. Let's put it that way. He's required a lot from men, and he has given us the anointing to be able to do it. He's given us the strength and the ability to do it. But it takes work to do that. Yeah. It takes work is good. This is what we need to say. Work is good. <laughs> <laughs> we, can't, yeah, we cannot allow our kids or even our spiritual family to always take the path of least resistance. Right. Challenge ourselves. Well, you hear something, well... You know, be like the Berean church. I'm going to check the scripture myself to see if it's so. Don't just, hey, Siri, is this right? No. Yeah, That's not AI searching anything out. <laughs> you never know what AI is going to put on there. Yeah. John writes 2,000 years ago, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. Fathers have such an important role in the church mm -hmm. and in the family. The, John stamps his value on fatherhood right here. Children to learn about Christ through their dads, through their family. And they grow and have the ability to win in life on their own. Not waiting for somebody to take care of them. It's one generation teaching the next generation, teaching the next generation, teaching the next generation. And that all has to start with fellowship. It has to start with respect and honor and ability to listen and being honest in those conversations. Yeah. And it's, it's helping them grow in their ability to win their own battles with Absolutely. against sin and temptation. Absolutely. This is, this is the power of it. And it's so important because, you know, we say the world's kind of coming at, it's coming at everybody, but it's coming at the heart of our kids because when you capture a child's heart, well, then yep. you have a longer period of time to keep making that effect. And we just believe that there is a delusion at work in the world. I mean, last week there was a satanic gathering, the largest ever of the satanic church gathered together. And things were promoted, like abortion, transgenderism, how to deconstruct from your uh, old religious upbringing. These were just some of the things that they had on their uh, seminar list of breakout sessions and other types of things. I mean, all it says to me, I think, is clear that a satanic side, mm -hmm. there's a satanic side to the issues that we're seeing affecting our culture today. It's not just political no. differences. This is coming from a spiritual realm, of, you know, that's affecting. And, and the interesting thing is a lot of these people that were there because they interviewed some of them. They're like, I don't believe in Satan. I don't worship Satan as a being. Well, the, for one thing, they were deceived. Right. You know, but Satan doesn't even really mind if you don't bow down and worship him. All he cares about is just be, get the person in opposition to yes. God. And that'll take its course far enough. Amen. <laughs> and maybe it will end up, you know, with a literal worship of Satan. But if he can get you to just to undermine the word of God in your mind, stray from it. The plan of Satan from the beginning has been for you to cause you to doubt yeah. God's word, change God's word. Did God really say he did it in the garden? It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just move away from God's moral standards, especially choose yeah. your own path. And it doesn't take much to look out at the world and see what's happening. You have big businesses, you've got food corporations, you have banks, schools, universities, all in their own way, promoting opposition to God. I mean, I saw a Doritos commercial the other day. It was like, what in the world? Doritos is advertising diversity, inclusion, and, you know, it's like, just sell a product that people eat and, you know, want to buy and what. <laughs> like, what are we, what is happening yeah. here? And see, these people aren't shouting like they did at this satanic gathering where the woman stood up and she literally ripped up the bible onto the floor and as they were all shouting hail satan in the background well you know you're not going to see it that plainly in the culture 
But this is really who's behind yep. it, pushing opposition. Mm -hmm. Throw this book away. You don't need this book. It's a hindrance. It's oppressive. And so we have to realize, you know, because we're going to get into these verses here in a moment about the spirit of the world, which the, yes. John says we are not to love the world. But this is because the world was going to turn our hearts away from God. But we have to recognize, you know, that we will either overcome Satan, which is what John was commending these young people for. You've overcome the evil yeah. one. Do we see the evil one? We have to see him at work first before we can overcome. We, we will either overcome him or he will overcome. We'll be overcome by him, yep, put it that way. That's true. And that's not too strong of a statement because there really is no neutral zone in this. There's light and darkness. There's no gray. Gray is already moving you into the darkness. Right. And so parents, and we were mentioning fathers particularly here and sons and children, you, don't, you cannot let your guard down and forget that we're in a spiritual war That's as right. we look out at the world. Keep praying for your child. Your prayers are powerful. Engage your child's heart around there. what they're thinking, yeah. what they're seeing, what they're questioning. Teach them about their faith. Teach them how to defend their faith. Mm -hmm. You know, don't trust everything just because then on the other side it's labeled Christian. I mean, we've talked with parents who spent good money, a lot of money, to send their child to a university, Duquesne University. Right. Went in as a believer, came out as a total unbeliever. Talked total, out of her talked faith out of by faith. the professors. Yeah. And so the world wants to imprint its value system into your heart, especially into our, our kid's heart. Let's look at verse 15. John goes on in these verses to say, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in him. Now, that's a good... Straight up. Straight up. Verse 16, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. Verse 17, and the world is passing away, and also it's lust, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so love for the world, you know, and all that it offers just begins on the inside. It tells you, like, the most important thing about life is now. <laughs> you know, yeah. and you're the central feature in it. You, you need to get what you want. You need to get your needs met. You need to get your own self-satisfaction. Do it your way. That's what the world is whispering. You only have one life to live, so, hey, get out there and try it, do it. Yeah. Get everything out of this earthly life that you can, you know, and hold tight to whatever it is you're finding, whether it's money or, you know, beauty or it's pleasures or it's fame, glory, all of it. Yeah. Find your truth. I mean, aren't we seeing this? Yes. Make your own statement. Do it your way. Now, this is Proverbs 17, says this, verse 24. The discerning sets his face towards wisdom. But the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. I need everything. Yeah. It's got to be now. I have to experience everything. I want what you have. I want what you want. And it plays it out in so many ways of like just, it really turns into self-idolatry. Yes. It all, it's all turned in on me. On It's subconsciously telling you to, you deserve the glory. Think about what happened in the Garden of Eden, and you could just see the parallel so easily. Yeah, it's, all this comes from the mind of Satan, that's for sure. You know, the same temptation that, Eve, you know, look, you can be like God. And every person who's born on this earth has that sin nature like Adam and Eve brought upon us. You know what? Guess what? We're bombarded day and night with images, words, uh, social media, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whatever else there is out there. I'm sure there's more than that. People stare at those electronics morning to night, scrolling, swiping, clicking. And, you know, look at me. Look at my truth. Here is this. People make the dumbest videos in the world. Amen. And they get millions of views. You know, get their <laughs> phone. Watch me take out the trash. <laughs> Million views. It's true, isn't it? Watch or, me I'll make the perfect bed. Yeah. Here's my morning. It's like, what? Do I care? Do I really care? But the, here's the key. We do all that all day, and then you don't have time to read the word. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's coming down. Hey, you know yeah. what? It, it, here's the key. You don't want to stand before Jesus when you have no opportunity to change and be judged for the way that happened. You want to be shocked now. You want to get shaken now so that you can change. Because if you change now, when God is showing you something, when the Holy Spirit is showing you something, guess what? You can get in line with the Word of God, and then eternal rewards will be granted to you as you are a doer of the Word, as you stand in faith. But all this stuff, this, well, it's an iPhone. (laughs) It might as well be a me phone. <laughs> it's a focus all on yourself. All of this. It creates more and more what? Envy, rivalry of the heart. It creates jealousy. People are killing themselves over somebody else's life. Yeah. Here's a clue. Do you know they only show the good parts of their life? Hello! <laughs> their life could be completely miserable. Yeah. I know it personally. The, somebody, the whole family went on vacation to Florida. Oh, look how wonderful it is. We're on the beach, this and that. Well, guess what? Behind the scenes, the teenager wanted to run away. And we want to we cancel somebody who disagrees with us. And it gives people pleasure. Good, I canceled them. <laughs> I feel so good now. Yeah. I'm in control. I'm like God. Or I want to belittle this person because it just makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm king. Uh-huh. You know, people are, people are actually proud of this stuff. And I'm sorry to say Christians are involved with this. Mm-hmm. Christians are involved with this. It's, it's, look at verse 16. What does it say? What is the lust of the flesh? It, it's actually craving and being preoccupied with self-gratification whether it's physical pleasures, sex, food, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Desires of the flesh can play out in selfishness too. Or laziness, really, extremes, Mm -hmm. obsessions, self-image. You know, you starve yourself because you want to look like this person, this movie star, or that, or this, or you know what? They have a personal trainer that they go to the gym five hours a day, (laughs) And they have all the money in the world, and they tell you, you should be like me. No. All this Botox, plastic surgery. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Faces are frozen. (laughs) (laughs) How old are you? (laughs) 85. (laughs) You know, the lust of the flesh, the eyes, the lust of the eyes. It's craving everything we see. Do you know that every commercial is driving that into you? You need this. You need this. You need this. But they have a better one, so you need, you now you can throw your car away, and you need a new car because, you know what? Theirs is nicer, but I want to make sure that they are envious of me. (laughs) You know? You know, here's, Psalm 73 says this. The rest of the eyes, though. It says their eyes bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot do you understand what that means yeah i me me i want i want i need i got the the eyes yeah they're bulging oh did you see the newest whatever you know a poor person could be like this it doesn't mean that you're rich you know you know think about these drug cartels i mean they're moving millions of dollars They're involved with governments. Iran was just caught with dealing with drug dealers so that they can have money and get money. Government. A government dealing with them. He asked him, why why are you doing this? And it, it was like, well, I grew up a gang member really poor. And I wanted to be rich. And so I killed my way to the top. Killed my way to the top, folks. These are things that we have to be aware of because you and I are bombarded with this all the time. And listen, people in my generation are not putting up with the bombardment and the race to steal your children's heart as what this generation is growing up now. 
they have it a lot tougher. You guys have it a lot tougher than we did. This is why you need to anchor yourself in the word of God. And you need to judge everything by the word of God. And it's our responsibility as a church to help. Yeah. Bring out truth. Yeah. Share truth. Mm -hmm. But in order for all this, this conversation to happen, there has to be this fellowship. There has to be honesty. So let's, let's go on to the pride of life, that third part of that. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What's that? Well, I think you mentioned the word pride, and every, you, you think ego, and that is what, really what it's connected to, the pride of life, you know, in our achievements, our possessions. Mm -hmm. Look at me. Look at what I've accomplished. And it's not that achievements and possessions, like accomplishments, are good. We Amen. should want to accomplish something good in life. And even possessions, possessions aren't bad. You know, we should, we should enjoy the possessions that maybe we've gained through our accomplishments. Mm -hmm. But it's this, pride is this secret, secret thing in the heart, like that you enjoy the status that it gives you compared right. to somebody else. All right, there's this, I, I did this, look what I have, and this sense of superiority that your possessions yes. give you. It's just this. Pride is, ends up, you know, in this excessive desire to be recognized, to be applauded, kind of to stroke the ego. I mean, this is the person like that you say, well, I took a trip to the New Jersey shore this summer, and they're like, oh, that's nice. Do you know what I did? I went on the Mediterranean, and we were, <laughs> well, you know, they go on, we were at this resort, and the next thing you know, it's all about them. It's like some, it's this, you want to be, try to be one up all the time. Yeah. That's the pride of life. Yeah. You know, and I heard this, I thought this was a good illustration. Somebody said they described that the human ego was like a memory he had of going into a, a barber shop, an old barber shop whenever he was a kid. And you sit in the chair and there's a mirror in front of you and then there's a mirror behind you. And you ever have that experience? where you just sort of like see this infinite number of times that you're reflected in it. And he said, it's like that. this is the pride of life. It's, it goes on like a million-fold yeah. reflection of I, 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 me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> and there's really so much of this going on in the world that yes. we're affected by it. Like we recently read of a... Oh, this was yeah. this Mars basketball coach. Did anybody read that article? Uh, she quit. Very successful very successful she'd been doing it for years and she quit all of a sudden surprised everybody and the whole article in the paper was she quit because of the parents yeah she says it wasn't because I'm tired I have a whole, whole lot of coaching left in me but right it's the parents are coming why isn't little Betsy up there and she's not in my 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 daughter's just you just want to lose yeah, I mean, just this was year after year after year. She just stopped putting up with it. Yeah, and the parents complained. Yeah. I mean, they threatened, they Took slandered her, the, her. Yeah, went before the school board to complain about her. And you'd think, well, why? What? What was this coach doing wrong? They wouldn't the, put the people who were not as good in. She said, "We, we were in a lot of games this year that were close, and we want to win. A coach gets paid to win." And the people, she says, the people, the parents that complained the most, their kids came late to practice. They mm -hmm. didn't work hard at practice. And they wanted to be in. And, of course, everybody's kid is the next. Yeah. Who's a basketball player? I don't <laughs> Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Michael, He's the yeah, next. Right. They're the next Michael Jordan. And it's just, it's. Did anybody happen to look on Fox News, uh, the uh, off a of phone, off a of phone? Well, they they showed a uh, a parent of a high school baseball player coming around, sucker punched the umpire, knocked him completely out. This is a disabled vet, this umpire, who wanted to help the community and give back. This parent unremorseful the whole time, even when the police arrested him. And the umpire was just trying to calm his boy down because his boy obviously calling ball and strikes and just started to be obnoxious and just kind of kept driving and driving. And the umpire stayed steady, just said, calm down. Let's just get back to the game. Relax, relax. Just let's just yeah. play ball. Well, at the end of the inning, 
that umpire came out, opened the gate, and just kind of was stretching his legs, looking back over the field. That guy comes around. It's all on video. Comes around and cold cocks him. Folks, this is the culture that you are living in. Don't stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not happening. This is where you have to be so tenacious holding on to your faith right now. Well, and I think as parents, like, I've heard this over and over again, that they're, you know, this is common in hockey. It's common in baseball. Like, parents go crazy, you know, about this, this issue. You're like, yeah, you should have been picked. Right. You know, they're, you're, they're reinforcing the spirit of the world inside the child when parents do that. Yeah, you should have been picked. Yeah, you should have been recognized. Yeah, you, you're better than the other people. I don't know why the coach did this. Bad mouth the coach right in front. The of, refs were against you. You like making your child feel like, oh, you're the you're such a victim here, and everybody mm. else is against you. And this is not a good way to parent, <laughs> because you're reinforcing the spirit of the world and, and these things about even the pride of life. Yeah. Like, like look at me in the child's mind. It's like it's all about you, you, you. What about the child's responsibility? You know, and teamwork. Mm -hmm. I mean, teaching your child how to lose gracefully is not easy, but it is necessary because life is going to provide your child, as we all know it, if you've lived in the world, a lot of opportunities for learning that life isn't fair. Yes. Not everything's going to turn out fairly. And what are they going to do? How will they weather the disappointments and the losses that come against them in life? Yes. We want them to come out better and stronger, right? With better character, this is what John was saying. You young, young ones are overcomers. You know how to overcome the evil one. So we have to like teach our kids it's not through a sucker punch to the no. umpire yeah. or slandering the coach at the school board and saying, my poor child. Yeah. We have to teach our children not to just be, you know, the word, I guess, myopic, short-sighted. It's like teach them the bigger picture of life. Show them scriptures like this. Ask, help them to ask themselves like the bigger questions even. What it, was my it, responsibility? And it's, yeah, that it's not, I know everybody wants to win. We should want to win. I mean, that's the point of playing the game. But it isn't just about winning. I mean, what may God be helping us in this situation to see about ourselves, about mm -hmm. life? How should I respond? You know, and when so you're we're, teaching. We're, we're, we're oh, trying ahead. to teach our children to do well in life, like to grow yeah. <laughs> So that they overcome evil, they don't side in with it, with the way the world is. Mm -hmm. it's, the truth is, it's like all life, you're going to win, you're going to lose. All of us. And what we have to do is be able to, to deal with it in a godly way. Yeah. Yeah. Model. We want to model to our kids how to do well at life. How should I handle my frustration with this umpire? Well, what that parent did was... Not how you handle it. No. This, this, and, and you have to remind our children that in the midst of the wins and the losses of life, that all this is helping them to do life well. Yeah. So that when they're 35 years old, it's like, I learned that lesson back there. That's not the way to handle it. And their character will grow stronger. And actually, as a follower of Christ, we should be asking them, you know, teach us. We should say, Lord, like, what? Teach them to ask. Lord, what yes. could I have done better? Right. A little bit of self-awareness goes a long way in this. Could I have worked harder? Yeah. Was I a, how can I be a better team player? See, this is, this is what you're doing is, is, listen, if people like you, you're going to have friends. But if you're, you're waiting for your dad to sucker punch somebody, <laughs> guess what? You're not going to be invited to play. That's right. And you're not going to end up with too many friends. No. And this is, this is what John is, is, especially, he's speaking to us. He's speaking to all of us. He, it's not just men only. It's men and women here. We've got to get ourselves and understand where we are spiritually. Am I the, the guy that's been in church for 30 years and I didn't grow anywhere? Am I still that infant? Or am I, am I into the young men? Uh, or, you know, our goal should be trying to be a, a spiritual father. And, that's, and not just to the people we like, but to everybody in our church. Folks, there's going to be some trouble coming. And what's going to strengthen us is that fellowship that we have here at this church. 
you're going to be wanting to be by believers because the world is after your kid's heart, they're after your heart. And we have to understand God is expecting us all to grow. He's expecting us all to grow. I don't know about you, but I want to be a spiritual father. I do. I want to help somebody improve their life. I want to help somebody avoid trouble. I want to help somebody maybe not get pregnant or not go to prison or not be drunk and drive. There's a huge responsibility on the church, but we can do it because greater is he who's in us than he is in the world. The Holy Spirit will guide and lead us into all truth. But it starts with honesty. It starts with that fellowship, true fellowship. It starts with honor, respect. And this is what we need, especially in this time in human history. So let's allow the Holy Spirit to help us find where we are on the journey. And I think declare to him that, you know what, Lord, I, I want to be a spiritual father. You, you, you definitely want to ask him to help you get there because you want to have fruit that lasts. It's a life that you can change. Father, I don't want to be the same as I am now in three months. I'm asking you to come and correct me. It's that old adage, Lord, shock me now, not shock me later. I want to be able to change. I want to be able to have fruit in my life. And we recognize, Lord, forgive me for all of my failed opportunities, the opportunities I missed, and maybe where I got off and I'm with the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Lord, forgive me for that. I don't want to walk in that way. I don't want to love this world. Because you say if you love this world, the love of the Father is not in us. So thank you, Father. As you hear our prayer and ask you to give us. You might be here today with every head bowed and eye closed. You might be here today and, you know, you're recognizing I just come to church and I have never been really operating in the ways of God. I'm not born again. If that's you and you want Jesus Christ come into your life to make you a new creation altogether and to forgive you of your sins and put you on the right path, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And you want to walk in the light as he's in the light. If that's you, I'm asking you to raise your hand up high enough so that I can see it. Then we'll pray a prayer. Old congregation will pray a prayer and you'll be saved. Thank you, Pastor Steve and Pastor Mamie. And thank you all for joining us today. We're so glad you uh, came to be part of Community Life Church today. Um, I want to remind you, if you are a first-time guest, make sure you drop off that card in the back back there. Also, if you have any tithes or offerings, drop back in the box. Don't forget to do that on your way out. Uh, we also have our prayer partners up here. If, if anybody needs prayer for anything, if there's something you're going through in your life and you just want somebody to come beside you and pray with you, uh, we have prayer partners over here that want to pray with you and they're ready to pray for, with you. So please feel free to come forward and uh, we'll, we'll connect you with the prayer partners over here and let them pray with you this morning. If you would all stand with me. As we close today, I want to commission you from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly more than all we could ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us, go with God from this place. You've been commissioned to be a light to the world and to the people around you. Have a fantastic week. Be blessed. You're dismissed.